Dear friends, we will start in two minutes. Uh, this screen will happen, uh, this uniform, and we will need that. Dear friends, uh, we are very happy to have with us Dr. Phil Gittins, 
He has over 20 years of leadership programming and analyzing experience in the area of peace, education, youth, and community development and psychotherapy. He has lived, worked, and traveled in over 50 countries across six continents, taught in schools, colleges, and universities around the world, and trained thousands of peace and social change related issues. He represents an amazing combination of peace in the theory and practice. Phil has received multiple awards for his work, including the Rotary Peace Fellowship and the Catherine Davis Fellowship for Peace. He is also a positive peace activator and global peace index ambassador for the Institute for Economics and Peace. He will talk today on the collaboration of academics and non-profit sector with the topic innovative peace building beyond the classroom. Will, Will, please, oh, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, sir. Ah, uh, uh, yes, that one is, yeah. So is it the beginning? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a second to share the screen. Thanks, as you can see. So, thank you everyone. Can, I, can you hear me? Is this working? Can I not hear you? Did you turn it in? Yes. Oh. Is it working? Is it working? Not, um, in case another one. Oh, oh. oh. this one. Oh, there it is. Uh, it, it must be over upstairs. Okay, perfect. So, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. Um, and huge shout out and congratulations to all the other speakers that have spoken so far fantastic presentations uh, amazing information shared and i'm sorry to disappoint you already in the presentation i'm going to do right now um so goran spoke about what we want to talk about today i might stand up as well at times is the connection between academics and non-profits and how do they go about collaborating and I think it, in, in the presentation, it will try and explore some of the things that we've been thinking about these days. How to better engage academics in non-profit work and vice versa. In particular, I'm going to talk about a pilot project, which will be on war, and I'll say something about that shortly, did with a university in New York called Adelphi University, very forward-thinking university. And part of the aim there was to better engage academia in collaborations with industry and vice versa and to better support university students in educational activities so learning about peace thinking about peace but very importantly the doing of peace as well there's often a kind of divide between the two so we piloted this project last year over one semester so that's more broadly what i'm going to talk about and in could you please tell me when there's at least 10 minutes left, because I want to leave at least 10 minutes left for, 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 thank you, thank you. So, how are we going to do this? I'm going to talk about these three things, uh, these, these, these things. People, who was involved, what was the problem we wanted to address, what was the purpose of our project, what was the process through which the project was done, what were the products, the results of that work, and some projections for the future. So that's the task that we have in the next 20 minutes. It's not working again. Okay. There we go. I don't know if this is working. Um, okay. So first of all, I want to do a shout out to my colleague here, um, Professor Kushman. So when I was thinking through this project, I wanted to collaborate with a particular university and Susan Cushman is actually an alumni of World Beyond War. So World Beyond War trains, works with thousands of people around the world, including university professors, etc. So big shout out to Susan. Yeah, it's not working again. <laughs> okay, thank you. For those that don't know, World Beyond War is a global grassroots organization. We have membership in 193 countries. Um, 
We're very fortunate to be globally recognized as one of the leaders, particularly in war abolition work. We won the 2021 US Peace Prize, and just before that, we won the Global Educators Challenge, which was handed to us by the Global Challenges Foundation and the London School of Economics for our innovative and creative approaches to peace education and teaching about global challenges. Our executive director has been nominated several times for the Nobel Prize. So we, we have a global recognition uh, for our work. Next, please. Yeah, I should have brought my clicker. Next. Okay, this is going to be quite annoying because it, it's, it needs to click through quite a lot. Um, so I'll talk about the problems. Next, please. The gap between scholarship, what we teach, what we research in universities, in comparison to what's needed in real society. There's often a gap. Next, please. The gap between, as research shows, theory and conceptual thinking in universities and project management skills. There's some research done by my colleagues that looked at what are graduate school educational projects and programs doing and how are they preparing students? But it actually shows that there's a gap between what universities are providing, the theory, the knowledge, the ideas, and what employers want. So employers and students want project management skills. There's a real gap. And of course, we know there's a gap between what academics do and what the community wants, and also often a gap between what acad academia is doing and industry. Next, please. Intergenerational work. How can we engage adults and young people in this peace work together? That's a real challenge. You know, how can we engage youth and adults in this collaborative work? Next, please. This is a big challenge. How do we think of students, young people, not as objects, so something that they're recipients of, we do to them, and see them more as subjects in something in terms of something that peace building work that they do themselves. Not, not recipients, so thank you, but actually something that they do. Next, please. And blended learning, a huge challenge that we all have. So although the focus today will be on a case study of New York and will be on more, some of the things that we get at in this project, I think try and address some of the broader challenges within the peace studies, peace building, peace science field. Next, please. Uh, my approach has always, for the last 20 years, has been to trying to better blend science and action. There's a really massive gap between there. And the, 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 the articles that I wrote, here's one that I wrote for the Journal of Peace and Conflict Studies, which was trying to make an argument we should be using a methodology called participatory action research a bit more, which combines research and action with participation. And I fleshed out these ideas. These are two, two books that I wrote or, or edited as well. And I love this idea by um, Anthony Bing in 1989. He said that good peace studies should be supporting students to think their way into new forms of acting and act their way into new forms of thinking. There is the, the, the real justification of the link between thinking, science, research, and the doing part. So a very, very uh, you know, important uh, frame for informing the work that I do. Next, please. So, what was the project? The project, in its broadest sense, wanted to develop a methodology for engaging academia, academia and industry in collaborative work that engages students in the design and delivery of peace building projects. In order to do that, I wanted to collaborate with a particular university. Um, so we collaborated with Adelphi University. Next, please. We did this in two ways, and this is the process. Education and action across one semester. The education part started off with Professor Cushman teaching her students, first year students, of an introduction to peace and conflict studies course, drawing on some of this literature, um, words, invitation to peace studies, very useful foundational book in terms of peace studies, very, very useful. But also there's a great book by my colleague David Smith, which is called Peace Jobs, a student's guide, very, very interesting book, I'd recommend getting that. And the book that I recently edited, A Global Security System, An Alternative to War. So the young people drew from all these foundational books to inform their ways of thinking about peace knowledge, peace science, etc. Then part two, they went, went and did their projects. So they designed, implemented, evaluated, and communicated a project. Next, please. So this took place. So here's a 
little bit more information, a uh, particular focus on the peace action part. What they did was that they used our foundational book, Global Security System, to inform their thinking about what the projects could be. So I will show you in a moment um, the Global Security System, but it revolves around demilitarizing security, non-violent conflict resolution, and peace uh, education. Next, please. So here it is. This is, a, this is our blueprint for ending war and establishing a just and sustainable peace, revolving around three broad strategies. And young people were tasked with deciding a project based on their needs that they'd like to address, which either addresses demilitarizing security, managing conflict like violence, and creating culture of peace. Next, please. Yeah, I'm going to go through this because it takes me time to say next, please, next, please, next, please, very, very quickly. Um, Demilitarizing security is about how do we take the money out of the war machine? How do we move away from a war economy to a peace economy? Next, please. Um, managing conflict without violence includes a whole host of strategies, but one of the things I think if there's one peace building organization we should be focusing on in terms of advancing our prospects for peace, it would be the UN. So we need to think of how we go about making the UN more democratic, working with the veto, and things like this. Next, please. And then the final one was, how do we create a culture of peace? So this is more the future oriented ways of looking at things. So peace education, peace journalism, peace research. How do we go about telling a different story rather than focusing on the so-called heroes of war? How do we focus more on the heroes of peace? Next, please. So after being introduced to the broad framework, young people then went away the students of the course, and then worked in groups of four to five and decided what they want to do for their projects. So they actually produced four projects. One was an elementary school peacemakers project. The other one was a high school students curriculum. The other one was an inter inter um, interreligious peace building project. And the fourth one was student organizing. Next, please. So I'm not going to read all this, but basically the elementary school peacemakers project did some research in New York State to find out what high school students are learning with regards to peace building in their high school. And then they then, based on that knowledge, wanted to develop a curriculum. And they, the idea is that they wanted to introduce elementary students to famous peace builders using non-violent action to try and bring about change. You can see some of them, Degani Weaver, Jane Adams, Alice Paul, etc. So they developed that curriculum in collaboration with the school and then piloted it to see how it would go. Next, please. Another one was another, um, another peace education program where they worked with um, another school in their area what they did was they again developed curriculums and they then made presentations both online and in person to, to the, the, the high school. Next, please. And then another one was interreligious um, peace building. Within the University at Delphi, they have an interfaith center, so they interviewed the director of that center to find out to what extent are we facilitating and promoting interreligious peace building on campus. So they used that research then and then went along to the Interfaith Center to talk to some of the students to facilitate a dialogue around different religions and how it plays out in the university. Next, please. And then the final one was uh, very closely linked to uh, activism, where they worked with Peace Action New York State, which is the oldest grassroots nonprofit peace organization known. Uh, in the US that has 18 chapters and 3,000 members. They interviewed the education director, the organizer, to find out what does it take in terms of organizing and, and mobilizing for change and what can be done to inform our work in the New York area. And then again, they filmed a webinar where they had a dialogue around these issues and asked the education director and the coordinator some questions. Next, please. So, of course, we're in university environments, we need to think about ideas of assessment. How do we go about assessing you know, what people have learned and also some outcomes? So I'll say something about that now. So what Professor Cushman did was that she tasked her students with putting together an implementation plan in terms of what they wanted to do with their project. Professor Cushman, myself, and others who work on more provided feedback on that. So rather than waiting till the end of the project, we give feedback as, it, as we went along. Part of the reason for that was to test our ideas 
and to see progression. Mm -hmm. So, okay, when they first started, this is what they thought, this was their plan, in comparison to the end, which was hopefully a bit more strategic, a bit more focused in terms of um, both the process and the outcomes. A pro uh, end of project report, a final deliverable. So there was an end of project presentation where the young people, the students, presented to World Beyond War and also Adelphi University to show innovation in terms of their work. And also, we see the outcomes of this project. Really, the broader thinking was always, how can we develop a model which could reach out to universities interested in both the thinking and doing of piecework and support students within one semester to do this? Now, don't get me wrong, it was a lot of work, and it requires more work from the professors, the academics, but um, there's really there's a lot of evidence to show that it was beneficial both for the students, both for the non-profit organisation, and also for the university in terms of thinking about the broader mission of what the university is here for, the, the greater good, you know, so not just to stay within the ivory towers, but to engage with the community. Next, please. Here are some specifics about the, uh, the actual proliferation part of the project. We wrote um, a, a report specifically for Adelphi University and World Beyond War to lay out the work that we did, to lay out the model. Professor Cushman did a presentation to, to the university on innovation in teaching in the university. We're here now, in terms of the, the, uh, another presentation, we've been invited to speak at the piece Justice Association Conference in October. We've got a place there to speak. Um, it'll probably be um, Susan that will do that. I will be in the US. And we've been invited to write an article for the Journal of Transformative Education. Maybe one for maybe one for this here as well. Okay, thank you. Next. So we had many challenges, and I can maybe talk about them. I think I'm doing okay for time, right? Yeah, okay, good. I want to leave a lot of time for questions. <laughs> So some of the implications, um, it was a lot of work, it was a lot of work for, for Susan, bless her, and, and you know, myself and, uh, to support the process. Um, I think if we were going to do it again, and we are going to do it again, uh, we would look at how can we build in more kind of ongoing mentoring throughout the process. But again, that has logistical um, implications as well. So these are some of the things that we think about. How can we support and utilize social media and technology a bit more? Um, what we will do next time is rather than the three foundational books that we use at Peace Studies, we will just use our, our book, The Global Security System, which really is a, 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 a bit complicated, but a good mapping of uh, peace and science, uh, peace and uh, war science. Um, raise the question, should it be group work or should it be, should individuals have the opportunity? Next, please to do their projects. Um, we might want to, instead of breaking it up in terms of the first four weeks, education, learning about the theory, I think, thank you, learning about the theory and things like this, and then the eight weeks of projects, we might just dedicate the whole semester to doing a project, because that in itself is very challenging. So these are some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, how do we have a structure in place which provides a framework for this work, but do so in a way that is organic and adapts to the needs? This is always a, a challenge for everybody involved with education, peace building, uh, community work. Um, and then also we're in discussions with the Innovation Centre at Delphi University about thinking through um, how to innovate moving forward. So we might have a yeah, standalone module, etc., uh, that we're discussing. And we're also in um, conversations with other universities. Recently I was asked to speak at uh, Columbia University in New York who are very interested in collaboration. I know you all have to do uh, or are interested or and will be reflecting on future projects. If you have interest with your university in collaborating, please reach out to me. We'd be happy to, to have conversations with you. Next please. Many, many thanks and thank you for you all for your patience with the clicker not working. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for your course. Is this functioning? Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Phil, for that first. And as you know, one of my real interests around this is the idea of demilitarizing de de um, and funding and watching how the economics of this work. One of the challenges I know that we have is, is having any of these projects become self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. 
how do we incorporate social entrepreneurism in such that we're not constantly relying on donations and outside funding in order to keep it going? Um, some cases from same institutions that are funding other um, pieces that might be in conflict with what you're trying to accomplish. So, what are some of your ideas of how to incorporate social entrepreneurism into what you're doing? Yeah, great, great question. Shall I address that question and then come to the next questions? Um, it's, it's a great question and, and a broader question that you're touching on. There's an issue within the peace building field about what can be called this idea of projectization of work. So just doing a project for like six weeks, seven weeks, going in there, doing the project and then going out again. Um, ideally, we would look at more kind of process orientated approaches um, to the work rather than this project projectization kind of work. Um, we have not cracked the code on this, and I know you and I and others have had conversations. It's you know it's it's a real challenge. Some of the things that we do need to think about is um, you know trying to get extra funding for this work to take place. As that's one thought. Another one, another thought linked to sustainability is to get it embedded within the university. So rather than just a standalone um, introduction to peace studies course, try and embed it across the university, and with that would come extra funding and extra support in terms of the faculty and things like this. Another idea linked to sustainability is that we've developed um, a World Beyond War Youth Network to look at sustained engagement moving forward with people that we work with, and specifically set it up in such a way that the youth network is co-created by and led by with and for young people themselves. So I've already said, I've said right from the beginning, the success and the failure of this youth network is down to you, the young people. We're there to support, you know, and accompany you, but it's really down to you. So I don't, we have not cracked the code in terms of your question. You know, I'm just giving an honest response in terms of that is the challenges that I think a lot of the field are facing. It's, it's a great question. But, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very good. And I, I was actually interested in, in something. So what I've noticed through my education so far, and I'm, I'm sure a master's student, so maybe that will be a lot different in the, different in the future, but I, I always notice that the, the curriculum and, and everything that we already have in place is always very cool. Uh, sometimes professors have to kind of run through content because there's so much to be taught. And I was thinking, have you found ways to incorporate uh, peace building in, in these aspects or such projects into uh, disciplines that already exist, that are already being taught? And if so, like, do you have some suggestions or, or good cases that we could take with you? Yeah, I think another great question, really, really good question. Um, you're right, and as we know, you know, professors, academics here are always under pressure trying to cover so much. It's kind of like I was doing in, in the presentation, trying to cover so much in so little time. That's not a good way to do things. You know, there's the famous saying, less is more. So through doing this particular model, we learned that, okay, next time around, we'll, we'll try and not do so much so that we can try and improve um, the outcomes moving forward. Um, there is, there is innovative models. So for example, in the US, they talk a lot about this idea of applied learning. But as the professor spoke earlier, there's a difference between applied learning and doing kind of activism and action oriented work. So not just applying what you've learned, actually engaging and co-creating the work. This is big focus now within universities around co-creation, co-creation, knowledge, co-production and things like this. So doing work with students, with the community, not about them or for them. And again, the article that I wrote on doing a PAR PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies tries to address you know, at least some of those issues, how we can go about doing it. But I'm very honest in the article and say, look, it took more work, it took more work to do these things. Um, I think we need some more good examples to show that, look, it is possible. Here's the challenges, but here is, you know, that was part of the reason why I wrote that article. Here are some examples of successful projects of how it works. But again, it's an ongoing challenge that I'm pretty sure many of the universities around the world are always, you know, grappling with. I don't think there's a, a universal answer out there. But I think if you think about it, peace studies is in a really interesting place and both a really challenging place. One, because we cannot look at the issue of violence through one disciplinary lens. We cannot look at the issue of peace through one disciplinary lens because peace is so interdisciplinary. Well, how is every single university pretty much on the planet set up? 
in terms of disciplines. I'm a psychologist from 9 till 10. I'm a sociologist from 10 till 11. That's not how the world works. We need to kind of rethink the university and take more of a systems approach. But that's that's a longer conversation <laughs> and another you know another yeah another day's work uh, to you know to discuss that how it might look. <laughs> Great question. Hi. Uh, my my question is about the ethics of intervention because it's one of the things I was struggling with when I was working with NGOs in this building. And uh, in particular, the the dichotomy that I that I found the walls between peace building as a stability provider activity, providing activity or a value promotion activity. And I it completely said like uh, when without being uh, with radical honesty when we say the word peace, what we actually mean is the liberal idea of peace and the promotion of the liberal world values. Uh, there are other discussions on like known Western values in peace building, but the hard core of this is based on Western liberal values. And there are a lot of societies in the world that look at these values as inherently subversive. If you if you put together the list of grants receivers from the EU and the list of uh, foreign actors in Russia, there's a huge overlap. And when Russia speaks about um, hybrid warfare, that Europe speaks about democracy promotion and the humanitarian aid. Um, my question is: uh, it, it, how, how do you see uh, this this um, trade-off between promoting stability? Um, in, in peace building and accepting that there are societies that are not based on liberal values and promoting values that we think are good for the future of the world. Mm. I, I really like that question and I said to you yesterday I liked your question or your, your reflection about ethics as well so I'm glad that you asked that because I want to respond to that, I think it's a great one. Um, yes, peace building should be based on science but also we need to remember that, that social science and research is a moral discourse and that means it's an ethical discourse. It's not just based on evidence and if it's, based, it's a moral discourse that means that we need to check the implications of the work that we're doing with the people we're supposed to be kind of serving and working with. So that addresses the idea of this ethical obligation. Um, linked to that you said that peace, you know, when we're speaking about peace, we're thinking about liberal, mostly liberal. That is true that the field generally over relies on our understanding of peace informed by a liberal framework. And you can check out lots of people have wrote on that Oliver Richmond, Roger McGinty, John Paul Lederach, um, Altazer, all talk about that very much informed. But there's also an emerging discourse which, which talks about ideas of local peace building, hybrid peace building, indigenous peace building, etc. Which is emerging but in no way as, as uh, privileged a position as what the liberal peace is. Um, for example, I will be in Germany, we'll be bringing a load of peace scholars together to Germany for five days to look at the idea of decolonizing peace, you know, which is a, um, a very much trending kind of issue right now of how do we go about doing that. So all I can do is just acknowledge what you said with regards to that about the liberal values. That is true. We're very much over relied on a global north way of looking at peace. Think about many of the, the, the world's leading um, peace scholars. Johan Galton, Norway. John Paul Lederach, US. Uh, Adam Kerr, um, England, US. Um, you know, many of Kenneth Balding, Elise Balding, US. That, you know, that, that, that's part of the reason why a lot of the peace scholarship around the world is, is largely informed by white, older males from the Global North. Not exceptionally, but a lot of it is. So we have a lot of work to do, sure. Thank you. Thank you, dear Phil, for your very interesting lecture on the collaboration of academics and non-profit sectors with the topic on, especially thank you for your advice on how to improve educational system and what we have to do with peace education. Thank you, dear Phil.
And now we are very happy to welcome at our peace conference Jordan Dazzi, attorney and professor, the founder and executive director of Albanian Rule of Law Center. Professor Dazzi is the founder of the Dazzi and Associate Law Firm. He has over 15 years of professional academic experience in the field of law and human rights, and currently he is also serves as lecturer at Tirana Business University and at the School of Advocacy and of Albania. He published books and academic articles in the field of international and European law and human rights. Today, Professor Dazi will speak about a very important topic, promoting human rights via obligatory human rights teaching at the university studies as a key peace promotion instrument by the academic community. Jordan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that very long and detailed presentation. I'm very honored to be part of this uh, very unique uh, event, and uh, all the thanks goes to you as organizer and everyone who is uh, part of this uh, activity. Uh, I try, when I propose my topic, I try to be as close as possible with the main conference topic, and uh, since I'm a human rights lawyer and a professor of human rights for many years, that's, I thought that the best way that the academy can uh, contribute to peace and development is, uh, without any doubt, contributing by teaching or uh, human rights. So basically, uh, the whole presumption is based on the idea that it is well proven now that the more democratic states uh, we live in, the less chances are that those democratic states be involved in armed conflicts or or act of aggression, let's say, which is different from just being in, uh, in armed conflict. On the other hand, I think that it is very important for every society to have human rights education as the only way how to make people more aware of their rights, to make them more powerful in regards to claiming uh, respect and protection for their rights. But at the same time, there is a huge development uh, done in recent decades regarding the human right to human rights education. So, uh, referring to the first, uh, you can go to the second, uh, please. Uh, the third one. Just the third one. So, uh, the first time when the uh, right to education was provided in international document was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As you can see in the Article 26, basically it provides the full basis that gives the idea that human rights education is a basic human right. Although this document is considered to be part of so-called soft law sources of international law, yet because of very widely accepted and also many states unilaterally have declared as such, now has become part of international customary law, which makes the entire uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights a legally binding document, including also the right to education and human rights education as a specific one. Uh, just go to the next one. But this is not the only source. There are many other sources which provide the uh, human rights uh, education as a right also in other soft law sources, uh, including uh, the Declaration for the Human Rights uh, Education and Training, and we have also many other resolutions adopted by UN uh, General Secretary uh, uh, Assembly and also other treaties, and go ahead, the next one. But also we have very solid base in many international treaties, which are first, uh, the most important for our region is the European Convention in uh, additional protocol one, Article 2, it provides also the right to education, and we have also two covenants of the uh, UN. One is for political uh, and civil rights, and the other one for economic and social and cultural rights. It is very obvious that most of the time we understand these uh, articles only for the right of uh, education as, as a right, but to read it completely and to, 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 to be understood on the right context, Referring also to what the Vienna Convention on the Law Treaties provides, how a treaty should be interpreted and also be understood, 
which provides the legal basis for everything, uh, it is obvious that all these uh, articles provide the right, human right, right uh, provide a specific right as a human right education. So, uh, uh, when you say education, we should understand as a separate right within this article also the human rights education. So, we have a human rights education which is an obligatory right to every state. And this is very important because so far we have understand uh, we have understood education the right to education in a very uh, narrow way but by understanding it this way and it is obvious that many other sources refer also to this understanding that uh, for example if you just go to the website of European Parliament you'll see that when they refer to uh, human rights education they provide the same legal basis by accepting it as a legal a legally binding right now. So this is very important. Why we should emphasize the importance of recognizing human rights education as basic human rights? It is very important because by doing this, you oblige first the states to protect, to respect, and to fulfill this right. On the other hand, it gives the right basis also for everybody who is involved in uh, teaching, also in human rights teaching and human rights defense to invoke this right every time. <clears throat> we all uh, accept the importance of uh, human rights, uh, for example, to, to due process. The due process is one of the <clears throat> most important rights. Why? Because there is the right to provide the guarantees for the respect of other rights. But just to make a comparison, uh, actually, the human rights education as a human right is much more powerful than this right, because while the due process helps you in, within a process in a single given case, this human rights education gives you a very powerful general instrument in hands of everyone. So, we cannot pretend to be democratic states or to have a rule of law and democracy without educating people with their rights. And this is not only but the people, but also everyone who is working for the state. It is very important. Uh, so normally what's the uh, can be done uh, since we accept this one i think that also vienna declaration uh, uh, an action program action of 93 provides also the same orientation it is now an obligation for states to teach human rights so the question is how we can do it uh, well Many law schools, they have courses on human rights, but this is not something general. My proposal would be that since human rights are very important, very crucial for modern society, uh, to involve a kind of general syllabus of human rights for every kind of higher education teaching, but this does not exclude, of course, uh, every level of education. Uh, normally, as uh, it is provided also in the Declaration of UN, the Declaration on Human Rights, Education and Training, it should be uh, uh, contained in like in three uh, three ideas. First, should include human rights education about uh, rights, knowledge, and understanding human rights uh, norms and etc. And what is most important is to impose and to kind of to cultivate respect for human rights. And the other one is to create a culture of human rights. So we should uh, transform our schools and our education system into a human rights friendly system. By doing this way, we certainly we will contribute for peace and development. I think that the academia is the most powerful instrument that our society has to achieve human rights, respect, and to fulfill human rights obligation. Uh, only by uh, creating the necessary culture we can uh, call people and we can promote them to, we can uh, promote them to be involved in human rights causes. Uh, it is without any doubt that this has to be done on the basis of universal principle of human rights. So, no discrimination, free access <coughs> to everyone, and of course, human rights training should be uh, a permanent one, 
and should include all kind of state options because it's very simple. The state is the uh, biggest violator of human rights in every country, regardless how democratic it is. Still, the state is the one who mostly violates human rights. This does not exclude the private sector, who, because of uh, the privatization also and the transferring of public rights to the private sector, has become in all ways more and more powerful and, of course, a more potential violator of human rights. But still, the responsibility of state to oversee all these uh, transferred rights to the private is still belonging to the state. So that's why the entire uh, focus should be on the state officials, how they can uh, work and promote human rights. Uh, of course, in order to have a very functional uh, human rights protection system, every state should have in place a human rights monitoring system mechanism, which cannot be existing without human rights indicators. So every state it is obliged to develop a set of indicators on human rights which will help to reshape or to reorganize every kind of strategy they have in place or they may want to have in place in the future. Uh, none of the states basically, especially in the Western Balkans, is having in place uh, detailed human rights indicators. Why we have indicators for everything and we collect data for almost everything there is no interest so far to have human rights indicators, which may help states to not only to have detailed quantitative and uh, qualitative analysis on different issues, but of course will uh, enable every state to really think about uh, how they would uh, implement the human rights. Because we do accept the idea that some human rights are progressive rights, which needs a lot of resources and time to be achieved, but still, I think none of uh, the countries of the world is so poor as not to uh, provide the minimum standard of human rights. It is only a matter of uh, priorities, and for many decades, our states, unfortunately, have left this priority to be among the least one, which, to my understanding, should be the priority number one, because you, uh, you never can expect a state to be a rule of law state without having a, a, a culture of human rights are widely established in that country. So this is more or less what I wanted to discuss with you and I think it's uh, very important that us as a uh, part of the academia uh, we should be very, uh, we, sh we should consider ourselves as human rights defenders in every uh, thing we do, and of course, this relates also with uh, research of, uh, and ethics of research and everything. But by uh, uh, transforming our institutions into friend, uh, human rights friendly institutions, I think is the first step. And of course, the government should provide also funds for all these kinds of uh, education activities that has to be free of charge and has to be accessible to everyone, especially to uh, mostly vulnerable groups, which needs more than the rest of our society. So thank you very much, and I, I welcome your question. Thank you very, very much for an interesting presentation. We have 15 minutes left for discussion this time. I'm Thomas from Croatia. Thank you for this very interesting and important talk. My question would be since uh, I feel you have envisioned this as a universal curriculum, universal syllabus for national and international universities, how would you preserve it considering the autonomy of universities? And I have one example presented from healthcare. This is, this is my domain, public and global health, in many projects. I collaborated also with the US Center for Disease Control, CDC. And whenever Universal healthcare as a human right was mentioned. They recused themselves from the publication because they didn't want to discuss that. So, how would you maybe prevent something like that happening in this syllabus, this curriculum? Thank you. Well, uh, one of the basic uh, notions of human rights is the universalism. So, human rights are universal. This is the basis. This does not exclude that 
this kind of syllabus needs to be adapted with country specifics because some countries may have some uh, different issues which may require more attention in such training. But uh, referring to uh, human rights, uh, uh, to the Declaration of Human Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, the general framework needs to be universal. So, but this does not prevent any country to overcome and to even improve the content. But this is the minimum standard. So even human rights as such are the minimum standard, but every country is uh, allowed and even uh, promoted to, I mean, uh, pleased to, to, to increase the standards. Uh, but the, the minimum core should be universal. So, because it's very important that every one of us to have the same understanding of our rights. If we have the same understanding, we will have the same reaction and we will have the same uh, ways how we defend our rights. Of course, mechanisms of states might differ from one state to another, but it is rather an obligation of results rather than an obligation of conduct. So just like, let's achieve the goal, but we are free how to achieve it. Just try to achieve it. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I did have a similar kind of thought. I thought it was a very good question, actually. Really, really good questions I've got here. What's the creative tension between universal declaration and context specific understandings of human rights? So I think you can you know, address that. I love your idea of the human, you know, the human rights indicators, and it makes you think, doesn't it? Why? What have we got those? You know, we have the indicators for peace, for happiness, for terrorism, for, for lots of other things. You know, why not yeah, something systemic for, for human rights? You know, it's a bit very curious. So in your thinking about that, how, how would that process work, you know, in terms of who would go about collecting the data to see? Because you spoke about, let's, let's remember that the state is one of the biggest violators of human rights. So I'm just curious how, how, how that might work. In terms of collecting the data to show this this state is this, this state is this. Well, there is already in place a set of uh, framework of indicators developed by the higher commissioner uh, by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations. They have uh, identified like 16 indicators, but they are very general, so they don't really serve, especially for small countries. So, but they can uh, serve as a for uh, indicators that can be further developed. Of course, uh, there are all the, uh, uh, let's say, branches of government have to be included. For example, if you have the right to due process, one of the indicators might be how long it takes for a person to receive a final judgment. And this is very different from one state to another state. And of course, we have the saying that delayed justice is just no justice. So uh, by developing these indicators, which need to be very customized for every country, and this involves all the branches of the government, and of course, uh, all the governments which are uh, member of, of UN have also the obligation to report every year about the status and the progress of uh, human rights uh, uh, fulfillment obligations. So this is uh, just a beginning of this process and of course civil society in many instruments in regarding also the international Command on economic and social and cultural rights has a say in the whole process because they can uh, supply also other additional reports which are coming outside of the government resources so by doing all of this and overlapping all these activities i think uh, we definitely will have a better human rights environment and of course, by having the data, everyone can at least try to uh, say when something is wrong or at least can have a basis to come up with ideas to promote and to, uh, to improve human rights uh, issues. So, uh, uh, for example, in, let's say in Albania, we have the, uh, one of the main issues is the long lasting of hearings uh, of the cases. So, Someone has to wait at least like seven to eight years or even ten years to receive a final judgment. And 
if you are just close to pension, you have like more than 50% chances to die before you receive the judgment. And that's not justice. So there are many ways how to do, for example, the professor in the morning, Shimashovich, uh, if I recall, he just uh, gave us the example how to improve uh, the pre-child attention issues. And there are many ways how we can do it. But the basic of everything is education. If we don't teach people about their rights, their content, and how and it is very important. Uh, many rights are not justifiable according to state officials, but by realizing the interdependence and also the interrelation between rights, then you have all the rights are justifiable, uh, justifiable, right? Because you cannot tell to somebody you have the right to live, to life, but at the same time you don't provide the minimum standard of uh, housing or eating. It doesn't make any sense. So we do accept that housing is something that progresses, but at the same time if this sense to uh, lack of uh, possibility to live, then there is no right to life. So this is very important. And uh, of course, uh, we should not see states in this process as something that we have to fight with. We should rather see the state and the, especially the, the legislature as a partner. So even the state is not interested per se, at least in democratic state, to violate human rights. But if it happens, most of the time it happens because of ignorance of state officials or because the lack of supervision, proper supervision of uh, uh, human rights implementation uh, standards. So you have okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your lecture, uh, and thank you actually everything what you do for the rule of law. Uh, your lecture today is uh, concentrated on the human rights, but actually the rule of law is basic, uh, basis for all human rights activities. Without rule of law, we will have corruption, without rule of law, we, we will not have freedom, uh, democracy, and so on and so on. Actually, um, allow me to question, because you are really expert in the rule of law, uh, is it possible to have human rights without to implement the full framework of rule of law? Because, for example, when I'm thinking on the Balkan Peninsula and all countries in this Balkan Peninsula, I see the problems with, with the rule of law. And if we don't implement rule of law, is it, it is possible to have and to implement the human rights system. Uh, as you spoke now, you know, we need that, of course, I agree with you, but it's really possible to implement that? This is a very good question, I, uh, I must say. Well, I personally consider human rights as basic principles of law. And I defended this thesis many years ago, so it's uh, quite accepted now as such. And by accepting this, it means that when we talk about basic constitutional principles, actually the whole idea of why people created state was to, pre to better protect human rights. So by considering human rights as very basic principles of law, it means that everything which does not comply with human rights should not be constitutional. And of course, we have to distinguish rule by law and rule of law, which is coming from uh, uh, English, uh, American English uh, word. Uh, but I think rule of law doesn't uh, exist without human rights. Especially if we consider human rights as a very basic principle of the law. Of course, we may say that we don't have a fully functional rule of law state, but still, when we say rule of law and human rights, we should at least have formally existing rule of law state. If that's the case, then they can be also states when they have weak rule of law, but still have enough or satisfaction with human rights still to be achieved to the maximum level. But uh, most of the, I mean, all most of the states uh, being members of uh, Council of Europe, uh, they have uh, in their constitution. Uh, 
uh, the legal basis that consider human rights as a very uh, essential part of their rule of law state and democracy. So uh, it cannot exist a human right, effective human rights protection system in a state where there is no rule of law. We have states which they have different issues with the rule of law, but still, from the legal point of view, the constitution, uh, the rule of law state is in place. If we don't have that one, there is no human rights at all. I mean, just let's refer to uh, former East member, East Bloc members of uh, countries. I mean, they had all these kind of things uh, provided in the constitution. They have been all parties of uh, international covenants and Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but there was no human rights in these countries, including mine as well, until ninth. So that's, they have been states ruled by law, but not the rule of law. Thank you very much. I have a question, can I give the microphone to myself? <laughs> um, concerning um, human rights education, it, we can maybe consider it as, as a part and a very important part of a, of a wider concept of some sort of civic education. Uh, especially in uh, you know pre-academic times, so in primary schools and, and secondary schools, and this debate on civic education has been going on in Croatia for for many many years now. And one of the channels of this debate is: is it better to have a a separate course named human rights, for example, or is it better to make it an interdisciplinary? Um, topic that is then run through different other different courses that kids would normally have uh, within their school curriculum, and I personally don't think that these two need to be mutually excluding. But my question to you is, which to you, from your experience, which one of those concepts would you consider to be more effective, if um, you know, if you had to choose? If I had to choose, and hopefully in the future I will be promoting this idea from other perspectives, I hope. Basically, I think that by having a, a specific syllabus, it's the better instrument and the better option. Why? Because, of course, a syllabus might, and for sure it has to be interdisciplinary, because, for example, if you're teaching rights in a, uh, in a at faculty of math, for example, of course, you have to be interdisciplinary and you have to adapt how you're going to teach human rights for mathematicians. But there is still a place for everyone. So, human rights are somehow not only legal, they are everything. So, everyone has the right to understand them from a certain perspective. But the core of every right is very simple and very common. Otherwise, it's just like the law. Otherwise, if the rights are so complicated, they will not be considered any more rights. So, because the government will have big say how to understand them. So, that's why uh, only by relying on universal meaning of human rights and by providing this way, we can avoid any bias or any, uh, uh, let's say, not correct implementation of human rights. Uh, I think the syllabus needs to be universal in terms of uh, some uh, the ideas that they want to educate people, but certainly it has to be interdisciplinary way how to teach them. So the class and uh, the course material needs to be interdisciplinary. Of course, when you teach to lawyers, it's different, but when you teach to, uh, for example, uh, other sciences, need to be adapted. Uh, but I think that the state and the ministry of covering the education, I think, is responsible to make this obligatory. And every university has the autonomy to define the way how they will find it more interesting and more effective. But by having this as an obligatory course, I'm sure that in the course of some decades, our society will be more democratic. Okay. Just a very short question. Um, and, and, and this is about the, the curricula and all this process. I mean, I, I, basically I am against the uh, obligatory curricula in general uh, for 
um, these kind of, of, uh, of topics, which I think are more, much more experiential, or should be more uh, uh, transmitted through um, debates and um, um, experimental situations in the classroom, for instance. And uh, curricula, I, I'm not sure if this will be at the end after a few years just you know one of those uh, um, exercises that students have to do, um, but uh, where they do not really um, apprehend and comprehend um, the subject and the importance of the subject. So, um, and this is something I have been seeing, for instance, in the Middle East a lot because there are a lot of these things. Uh, human rights, these, and the, there are a lot of, uh, um, uh, for instance, in Egypt, where I'm living right now, they have this kind of compulsory uh, uh, curricula on human rights. And at the end, what you see of uh, the students is that they they learn it in the classroom, but after when they leave, I mean, things are you know, something like or something else. Um, so at the end, I, I, I agree on, on trying to introduce this kind of topics, not only in the university, in the schools, because actually, Think about values, yeah. and we think about um, um, skills, especially about values. Uh, the, 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 the biggest imprint is, is in, the, in the first year. So, in the school, is where we have to start introducing these kind of values so that in the university we can develop them at another level of intellectuality, of, of development, of debate. Yeah? But uh, for me, it's I don't know, it's, it's the question if. Uh, if uh, it should not be more uh, a transversal uh, topic to deal with. Uh, even in, in the mathematic room, why not? I mean, why not uh, in the mathematics classroom, why not in the physics classroom? And not only as a subject, but at the end, it will be maybe a little bit more um, kind of, um, just the subject. It's just a reflection. Yeah, okay. After the Bologna Declaration, uh, you know, the whole uh, higher education system in Europe uh, uh, went under huge uh, changes and now some states are just resetting what they had before. Mm -hmm. And this involved especially political sciences and also uh, jurisprudence as well. Uh, it is now quite very all, uh, widely accepted as practice that many states are trying to provide a core courses for certain disciplines which are obligatory. And the uh, autonomy of universities can add or reduce, but within a certain limitation. I think that by having uh, in mind the importance of human rights and uh, what can human rights education do for the society, we cannot leave it optional. If we leave optional, we have it optional already, and nothing is in place. So, because of, I mean, human rights education does not provide profit someone who does it, it will not be so much attractive. But basically, human rights education, it gives a lot of profit, first of all, for those who are going to undergo this training of education. Because it will enable people first to understand their rights. For example, I had experience to teach uh, something about law, very basic principle, to physicians. Uh, and they would say, well, oh, we are doctors, you know, we don't care. But it turns out that they don't know their rights most of the time and they are ending up sometimes even in criminal proceedings because of act of negligence, etc. So, this is something that we cannot leave as an optional. If we leave optional, nothing will change. Uh, or at least it will be very slow. So, uh, there is no harm to uh, academic world if we introduce this as an obligatory. Of course, every university would have the options to you how they do it, and there is nothing that can violate their autonomy. But I think the, the, the main idea is that this course should be a core course in every uh, field of study. This is going to make our society better. So uh, there is no harm for the society except of many benefits. Okay, thank you, thank you, dear Professor Dazi, uh, thank you, dear Jordan, uh, for a very interesting lecture on the promoting human rights and the importance of the rule of law. Especially, thank you for your concrete suggestion how to improve human rights educational system. Thank you, dear Jordan. Jordan.
And now we are very happy to have with us Boža Kovacevic, Croatian politician, diplomat, philosopher, lecturer, and foreign <coughs> politics media commentator. He was and he is editor of different influential journals such as Pitanja, Filozofska istraživanja in Rotterdam. Before becoming active politician, he was a lecturer at our university, University of Zagreb. He was a member of Croatian Parliament, a minister for environmental protection and special planning, and he was the ambassador of Croatia in the <coughs> Russian Federation. After his political and diplomatic career, he became again lecturer, this time in University College for International Relations and Diplomacy, Dr. Amerskut. He is the author of the four books and more than 60 academic papers. Today, Professor Kovacic will speak on an extremely interesting topic. Is the Second Cold War the only way to avoid the Third World War? Bonjour, floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much. I'm uh, very pleased to have opportunity to participate in this conference. Uh, we already witnessed uh, some uh, extremely interesting and ambitious uh, presentations uh, and even reports uh, on uh, already achieved progress in promotion of uh, peace uh, initiatives. This conference is, uh, I hope, uh, additional contribution in, in that uh, direction. And now I'm, uh, I'm going to present my modest contribution uh, uh, to, uh, to this conference. Uh, from uh, uh, human rights issues, I'm uh, moving to, to international relations uh, issues. So, uh, Chimerica, an economic and technological symbiosis between the United States and China, was expected by the West to transform China from its one-party political system into a more democratic one. Indeed, Chinese society has dramatically changed during the last 40 years. Chinese GDP per capita in 1979 was 272 US dollars. In 2021, it was 12,552 US dollars. Approximately 700 million Chinese people belong to the middle class today. But instead of initiating democratization of Chinese society, the new middle class pursued additional political legitimacy for the Chinese Communist Party. Politically stable, economically vibrant, and technologically advanced, China is not perceived by the West uh, only as a trade partner, but primarily as strategic competitor. Because of irreconcilable differences between Marxism and Leninism, and liberal capitalism, China is treated as an ideological adversary. Being not technologically stagnant as USSR was, and not economically autarchic as USSR was, today's China presents a much more serious challenge to the West than USSR ever has. Because uh, of the economic and technological interconnectedness between the United State, States and China, it's not so easy to adopt a political decision to start the Second Cold War now, as it was in 1949 to start the First Cold War. The imposition of economic sanctions against Chinese companies also uh, implies unexpected problems for Western companies. The immediate cut of their current activities would produce losses. Ad hoc 
announced sanctions produce legal instability and corrosion of rule of law. The business environment becomes unpredictable in China and in the West for Chinese companies as for Western companies too. But it is not only Chimerica and economic and uh, technological interconnectedness that is at stake here. A few weeks ago, Tony Blair, former British Prime Minister, made, made comments on the current stage of Western Chinese relations. He detected three inflection points in recent history. 1945, when the destiny of the world for the next decades was decided. The 80s, when the dissolution of USSR started and present moment as the third inflection point. Uh, Blair said, I quote, this new inflection point is qualitatively different from 1945 or 1980s. It is the first time in modern history that the East can be on equal terms with the West. And at both other inflection points, Western democracy was essentially in the ascendant. That is not true of 2022, or at least not clear. The end of quotation. Today, Western democracy is in crisis. It does not pursue well-being, prosperity, and equality of chances anymore. Instead, we are faced with economic instability, high inflation rates, the decline of social security services, a lack of affordable living spaces for many, the growth of the precariat, and the rise of populism. Attractivity of Western soft power fading. Anyway, the United States decided to start the second Cold War against China. As uh, John Bateman, a Carnegie expert uh, in international relations, recently stated, I quote, the most important decision maker for now is the US government. Washington has been a principal driver of recent technological decoupling with China and remains uniquely able to adjust this global trend up or down." End of quote. American uh, decision make makers uh, resonate in this way. If China succeeds in its intention to avoid a middle income trap, then China will become a first class superpower able to impose its system on the rest of the world. So China should be prevented. It should be contained not to be able to achieve a status of real economic, technological and military superpower. The logic of Western politics is this. If China is not prevented in its economic, technological, and military development, military conflict with China will be inevitable. Due to the avoid avoidance of the Third World War in the future, it is necessary to start the Second Cold War now. What can the academic community do about this? We can teach that humans are not genetically determined to make war, as we have heard yesterday. War is always an intentional project, but the final outcomes are often unintended for those who started the war. We can ask, is the second Cold War the only way to avoid the Third World War. 
<coughs> we must warn Western decision makers, makers that there is no guarantee that the final outcome of the second Cold War will be the same as the outcome of the first Cold War. And it was unquestionable victory of the West over the, the East. The important component of the first Cold War was deterrence. NATO successfully deterred USSR from aggression against Western Europe. But significantly, significantly enlarged and nominally strengthened NATO couldn't prevent Russia from its invasion of Ukraine. Post-Cold War NATO enlargement in, uh, in Europe has provoked more tensions than stability. Will the extended NATO engagement in Pacific region prevent China from military advent, advent, adventures in the South China Sea, or it will provoke aggressive Chinese reactions? In my opinion, it is necessary to intensify diplomatic activities concerning global security issues. It is not reasonable to expect that Western governments representing a minority of the world population can impose their security concepts and interests over the rest of the world. As climate change issues, security issues too need to become part of sustainable development discussions. Otherwise, we can expect only mutually assured destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kovacic. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? No question. Everything is clear. No, no, no. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, the question was around the idea linked to uh, a, a second civil and um, a second Cold War is needed to avoid a third World War. I'm very curious, uh, you know, about your thoughts on that. If we follow the idea, of, let's say. Uh, Gandhi, an eye for an eye, makes the whole world blind, or, or you know, peace must be pursued by a peaceful means, and peace should not be uh, pursued by a force and war and violence. I'm just curious, uh, you know, what, what your perspective would be on that? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, we are faced with the uh, organized uh, endeavors of Western governments to uh, present us uh, uh, that uh, if we uh, don't start uh, uh, the, the second Cold War, then we will have a, a third world war in recent future because uh, uh, China is developing rapidly. It's uh, not developing uh, only its uh, economic abilities. Uh, uh, it's uh, going to be more, in, uh, more and more developed uh, uh, in the uh, uh, field of technology. Uh, advanced technologies, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, space technologies, laser uh, laser technologies, and all those technologies have possible uh, dual use. Uh, all those technologies can be used in uh, for military purposes. So the next step is to expect that uh, uh, China. Uh, becomes a, a military uh, uh, superpower of the first uh, uh, first class, as the United States Army uh, is. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's necessary to 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 state that uh, in the last sixty years, China 
China enlarged its military budget each year, year after year. Currently, uh, 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 Chinese military spendings are approximately uh, one third of uh, US uh, uh, military budget, but uh, uh, it's growing permanently. Uh, that's uh, one aspect. The, the other aspect is that uh, 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 China improved the uh, 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 way of uh, uh, managing uh, their military forces, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, they implemented much uh, the, the, the artificial intelligence much more than United States Army uh, uh, did. So, in that respect, uh, 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 China China's military is a little bit in advanced compared to American military. So these are reasons uh, why Western leaders uh, started the process of decoupling and process of decoupling, uh, in my opinion, is uh, introduction uh, into the uh, second Cold War. But logical question is this, if conflict which is uh, 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 which is caused by by uh, uh, by ideological differences uh, is uh, uh, is uh, unavoidable. So uh, is uh, unavoidable is integrate in integrated globalized world. So why not to uh, uh, to divide world into uh, two ideologically ideological blocks and have a piece. Those two two blocks must not uh, 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 have uh, uh, intensive interrelations if they are technologically uh, uh, di uh, diver uh, divorced. Uh, uh, divorced. Uh, if uh, uh, if uh, uh, there is no uh, intensive economic cooperation, uh, it would uh, be less problematic if uh, uh, those different blocks are based on the, on the different uh, 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 ideological uh, positions. So uh, if, uh, if uh, Cold War is the only alternative to real war, then uh, uh, it's, uh, it's acceptable as a temporary solution. But uh, uh, those who are uh, very much engaged in creation situation in which uh, the second Cold War uh, will start soon, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, have uh, certain uh, uh, prepositions. Uh, the, the most important of them is uh, this, that the final outcome of Second Cold War would be the same as the, the outcome of the first one. But present situation, uh, 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 the fact that uh, 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 Western societies uh, are declining, that, uh, that uh, democratic systems, generally speaking, are in deep crisis. And on the other side, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Chinese uh, uh, autocracy, political autocracy, is able to provide uh, economic progress, uh, that situation, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, gives us reason to think about. It would be reasonable to develop uh, a Cold War, or it would be wise to try to start uh, diplomatic discussion, diplomatic conversation uh, on issues uh, which are uh, not only of, uh, of both side interests, but uh, uh, on issues which are of universal interest of all humanity. And these are, these are uh, beside the climate change issues, these are issues of security. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, it was very interesting. I would like to, my, my question is about governance because the first Cold War was not only um, military confrontation, but was also a confrontation between 
systems that were proposed as they were were competing in order to create um, st political stability and um, social wealth and etc cetera, etc cetera. and China at the moment is not very active governance promoting actor like there's been lately a wave of uh, defaults in, in China's partners for the Better Road Initiative and the government is not very keen on, not very happy on providing uh, bailouts for, for this, this, the states uh, because it, it makes the government more responsible for structural um, factors for the states uh, but for the for the economic development of the states and my question is if we are going into the second world war uh, the second cold war uh, is it likely that china will change its posture and will start being more engaged in governance and um, government system promotion activities yeah uh, presently, uh, 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 China's official position is this. China does not intend to impose its political system to other states. Uh, China uh, is not willing to be engaged in possible uh, changings of political system of other states. So uh, uh, on declarative level, it seems that uh, uh, China uh, does uh, not intend to impose its system and uh, its ideology all over uh, the world. But uh, frankly speaking, uh, currently uh, uh, China is uh, not uh, in all respects on the same level uh, uh, as United States are. And uh, China, uh, 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 China is uh, dependent uh, of uh, uh, cooperation uh, with the West. So that's uh, uh, the main reason why China is uh, against so-called globalization or, or, or uh, uh, deglobalization, because China was uh, uh, the state uh, who uh, who uh, made uh, much more profit out of globalization uh, uh, processes than any other state all uh, over the world. So, uh, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, that China, when uh, uh, it uh, achieves a, a relevant level of economic and technological development, is not ready to start to impose uh, its uh, ideological system. We can uh, not be sure that uh, uh, present day Chinese declarations are, uh, uh, are uh, how, to, how to say, uh, that they are reflecting the real Chinese intentions. But presently, uh, 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 China uh, is uh, growing economy. Uh, uh, China is faced uh, uh, with the fact that uh, uh, its neighborhood in Pacific region uh, is uh, is uh, under uh, in, in uh, security uh, uh, matters uh, is uh, under uh, control of United States and as a growing economy, uh, uh, China would like uh, uh, to uh, to. Uh, to be uh, respected uh, when uh, uh, when uh, 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 when security issues uh, are uh, uh, in question uh, and in present situation united states insist that uh, status quo must uh, remain in the uh, uh, pacific region but that status quo was established in the time when China was not member of United Nations, when China was a poor agricultural country. Uh, today, China is uh, 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 economic power number two, military power number two, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and uh, almost independently of the will of Chinese leaders, 
China is uh, uh, getting more and more influential all over the world. So uh, uh, the first step is uh, to be respected. And I think that, uh, that uh, Western government should accept that message. Uh, but to be respected today doesn't mean to have a right to impose its own political system in the future. So uh, uh, do, uh, do China intend to impose its political system in the future? I don't know, but uh, it must not be allowed, not only to China, but to any other state, if uh, that state uh, intends to do that. But present situation is a uh, uh, real war or cold war. Cold war is obviously better solution than real war. But, but uh, it would be illusion to expect that this, uh, the, the, the future, the Second Cold War, uh, could be managed in the same way as First Cold War was managed. Because the uh, uh, Soviet Union was not a real economic and technological competitor, and China is. So I think that instead of trying to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, fight Cold War till its final end, it would be much more reasonable to start diplomatic discussions on issues which are of Chinese interest too. Two seconds, Bojo. Okay. Yep. I'm here. Uh, Bojo, uh, I have actually short questions and I I will allow you, of course, to have some uh, longer answers. Uh, the first question is actually, um, some scholars talking we are moving from globalization to regionalization. What you are thinking about is the first. And the second question is actually, the many scholars talking we are in the new geopolitical paradigm. Um, I think you are agree with that. But uh, my question is actually, when did it start? Uh, this year in February, uh, in March 2020, or maybe in um, 2014? Uh, 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 regarding re uh, regionalization. So uh, uh, the logic of uh, Cold War uh, is uh, uh division not uh, regionalization the uh, division of the uh, of the world into competing blocks so uh it would uh, not be uh if if uh, there uh, is a second cold war it would not be realistic to uh, expect uh, regionalization we could expect uh, 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 respect for certain uh, regions and regional interest interests inside one of those blocks, but the inter blocks uh, uh, regions uh, uh, will, be, uh, will be impossible in, uh, in uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my view. So, uh, okay, we, we can uh, speak about uh, regionalization uh, in that sense that uh, uh, the world uh, will be divided into two, uh, in two regions, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, ideological division, in, in fact, or, or uh, uh, block uh, confrontation. Uh, and uh, can you remind me uh, uh, your, your, your second question? I, I lost the point. Uh, it was a question when it started. You know, we live in new geopolitical paradigm. When it started? Um, this year in February or before the pandemic, with pandemic, or actually 2014 with Crimea, or you have another suggestion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, I think that uh, in the way uh, uh, Zapad, uh, West, Western societies uh, didn't notice the fact uh, that uh, the world was uh, uh, changing. Uh, unipolar world actually was transformed into multipolar world and uh, it was not noticed uh, by the west 
uh, in time, or uh, the West didn't uh, react in time and didn't react in appropriate way. Currently, uh, uh, we are witnessing uh, 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 that uh, United States are trying to maintain their leadership role, but uh, 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 they understand that, uh, uh, that uh, in a multipolar world, it's not possible uh, uh, to, uh, to realize the same type of leadership as in uh, in uh, uh, in the framework of uh, unipolar world. So, uh, uh, in my opinion, it's a decision made by American political elites to insist on uh, ideological differences and on uh, on ir irreconcilable ideological differences and on security issues. Put together those two things uh, directs uh, uh, us toward uh, uh, block polarization toward uh, the next uh, 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 the next uh, uh, cold war when did it uh, did it uh, start uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, 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 2014 when, when russia occupied uh, uh, Crimea and the parts of eastern Ukraine. In fact, uh, it uh, started, in my opinion, uh, that, uh, how to say, the first signs of crisis of unipolar world uh, were visible, in my opinion, in 1999. What happened then? Uh, the, the 90s are uh, uh, era of Balkan wars, wars in, in uh, former Yugoslavia. In that time, Russian Federation uh, was closely cooperating with the United States. Uh, 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 we remember that uh, uh, leading Russian politicians, including former Prime Minister Chernomirdin, in fact, uh, uh, were American envoys to uh, Belgrade to Milosevic. They were they were trying to mediate between Serbia and United States in that time. Uh, it means that the cooperation between Russian Federation and the, and the United States uh, was very close. Uh, they have regularly meetings of uh, the United States Vice President on one side and the uh, Prime, Prime Minister of uh, uh, of Russian Federation on the other side. Uh, one of those meetings, uh, the last one, uh, was scheduled for March uh, 1999. Uh, uh, Russian Prime Minister Primakov was flying to Washington and uh, when he was over Atlantic, Al Gore, uh, Vice President of United States, called him and uh, told him that United States decided uh, unilaterally uh, uh, to, to intervene in the uh, uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And one of points uh, uh, on, on their schedule, which uh, should take uh, 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 place in Washington, was Kosovo issue. From that moment, a split between United States and uh, uh, and. Uh, Russian Federation started. Regarding China, uh, uh, Chai America, that idyllic uh, interconnectedness, economic and technological connectedness, was put in question when Xi Jinping, actual Chinese president, uh, uh, became a secretary general and then president of China. He announced uh, his plan of Chinese rejuvenation. Uh, he announced uh, his plan uh, of uh, uh, Chinese self-sufficiency uh, uh, regarding econo uh, economy and uh, technology. And these were signs. Uh, and of course, there, there was, uh, before that, there was a great Chinese firewall, uh, uh, the barrier which, uh, uh, which prevents uh, 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 
uh, internet contacts between Chinese citizens and the rest uh, of the world. So, uh, in my opinion, Russia is a relatively mal marginal player who is trying to make uh, some profit for itself out of uh, global uh, Chinese-American confrontation. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the first signs of, uh, of dissolution of human power uh, world, uh, in my opinion, uh, were visible in 1999. And today uh, we are uh, witnessing uh, that United States are trying to consolidate their leadership uh, among uh, world democracies. Uh, they organized, as you know, the Summit of Democracies. Uh, they announced that it will be uh, event on regular basis, and uh, they uh, they expect that the democratic world will follow United States through uh, the Second World War, which is uh, uh, Second Cold War, which is in front of us. Thank you, Brojo. Uh, thank you, dear Professor Kovacevic, for your lecture and great discussion on the future of international relations and new world paradigm. <clears throat> and I am actually a pity that our friends from the Zoom can't join to the uh, welcome reception of the Inter University Center uh, that's actually started uh, 15 minutes ago. Uh, so we have to move down. Guys on Zoom, thank you uh, to be with us. We will be back in 3.30. Thank you. Thank you.